Good morning. I'm Eileen Franco, and I'm from the New York State Department of Labor Division of Safety and Health. And today we're going to talk about the OSHA Local Emphasis Program for dairy farms. We're here today on a farm to talk specifically about confined spaces. One of the things that we find is that many people are confused as to what is and is not a confined space. First of all, we're going to talk about what is a confined space. A confined space has to meet three different criteria. One, it has to be large enough so that someone can get in to the space and do some work. Two, it has to be limited means of ingress and egress. That's getting in and getting out. And the third thing is it has to be not designed for continuous human occupancy. So any space that we look at has to meet that three criteria. This morning we have with us Courtney, who's from her dairy farm. And we're going to walk through some of the areas that Courtney has. Good morning, Courtney. Good morning. And Courtney works her dairy farm. And the first thing that we're going to look at is a couple of different things that are around the dairy farm and whether or not they meet that three criteria. And then after we do that, what we're going to do is to talk about the different hazards that can be in the confined spaces that would actually make it a permit required confined space. And then lastly, what we're going to talk to Courtney about is what are the activities that she has to do in those confined spaces, whether or not they can be done from outside the confined space, whether or not she needs to bring someone in to actually do the entry, or best yet, if all the hazards can actually be minimized and eliminated from the confined space, and then you can safely do the work when you enter. This is our field queen, keeps all the silage together. Um, we take it to the we actually put it in the dump truck and then put it on on the pile. Okay, so the, the grass goes in that way and then it shoots up into this big yep. tank. Now, I don't know, do you ever have to go into this for anything? Nope, there's nothing in this tank, but just it's just a holding tank. Okay, but let's go through the scenario anyway. First of all, remember, you always go through the three questions to see whether or not it's a confined space. One, is it large enough for someone to get into and do work? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Something that wouldn't be large enough for you to get into um, might be something like uh, a 55 gallon drum. The second question is, what is it designed for? Is it designed for someone to go into? No. Nope. It's designed for? It's just designed for holding. Okay, so it meets the first two criteria. And the third question is limited means of ingress and egress. When I look at this ladder, it tells me right away that there's probably limited means of ingress and egress because you're gonna go up mm -hmm. and you would climb into the top. So if something happened to you in there, say you banged your head or you brought in some chemicals or something to clean it, and you passed out, it would be difficult for you to get into. Yep. So it would meet the definition of a confined space. So this would be a confined space. If you ever had the need to get into it, you would want to take the precautions of either eliminating all the hazards or um, doing it properly so that someone mm -hmm. could get you out if you needed to be. About how big is this tank? About 500 gallons. 500 gallons. So this is large enough for someone to get into. And what did you say it's for? Diesel fuel. Diesel fuel. It's so off-road diesel fuel. Okay, off-road diesel fuel. So it's large enough for somebody to get into and do some work. It's not designed for human occupancy. It's designed to hold diesel fuel. And the third one is limited means of ingress and egress. And this is where we're gonna get thrown off because all we have here is a very small little hole to get into. So in this case, it would not be a confined space because you weren't able to get into it. However, keep in mind, Courtney, that if for some reason you had to change this, or maybe this contains something other than diesel fuel, and you had to cut a top in it and get into it, then we would go through the three questions again. Designed for human occupancy? No. It's designed for diesel fuel. It's large enough to get into, say you had to go in and do some painting or welding, then you could do that. And limited means of ingress and egress. And the idea behind that is that if it's hard to get into and get out of, if something happened to you when you were in there, if you fainted, you passed out, you got hit by something, it would be very difficult for someone to rescue you in there. So that's why that three criteria is there. Yep. Okay? Yep. Let's try something else on your farm to see what else all we right. have. All right, Courtney, so tell me what this is. This is our ball tank and it holds all of our milk for us. Okay, so limited means of ingress and egress. Is it hard to get into? And there's three caps you can take off that you can get into it. Okay, and what's it designed to hold? It's designed to hold all of our milk, and then when the milk tanker comes and gets it, it's empty. Okay, so it's not designed for human occupancy. And the mm -hmm. last thing is uh, obviously it's large enough for someone to get into it. Yep. Um, how do you actually get in if you had to get in? Uh, Ah, 
Now, do you ever have to go in? What's inside of this besides the, milk? These are, there are agitators in here to keep it cool when we're putting And it. are they paddles? Is it? Yeah, they're mostly paddle, they're like flower petals and they just move. Okay, so can you shut those off from outside? Yes, there's actually a control over on this side of it. Okay. And it gets turned on when we start our milking in the afternoon or in the morning. Okay, so you could actually, um, stop that from ever being able to turn on before yep. you go in it's got to be manu manually turned on every time okay do you ever have to go in and clean this out we, uh, we have an automatic washer with a bleach solution okay so we don't usually go in here okay but just for argument's sake let's say perhaps you did have to go in and do some cleaning out it's again it it's, meets all three criteria so it is a confined mm -hmm. space Second of all, although you know there's milk in it, if you had just bought this or had just come in, you might not know what's in there before. So someone mm -hmm. could have gone in and cleaned it with an ammonia solution or a bleach solution, as you said, mm -hmm. and there it could have been um, a bad atmosphere in there, which means anytime you breathe anything in, there's a possibility that you could um, pass out or um, have something that is going to limit your ability to get out. And therefore, rescue would be difficult because you've passed out in the bottom of that. Yeah. So the atmospheric hazard is actually the thing that causes the most amount of confined space fatalities because you can't see a, an atmospheric hazard. Also, you can't always smell it. Ammonia and bleach you can smell, but some things like if you had a different type of a pit, it could be methane. If you had something that had um, manure in it, you could have methane. And the thing with this tank is if it was methane, methane is lighter than air. So if you were up near the top of the tank, it could possibly cause you to, to pass out. Another thing is um, hydrogen sulfide. And again, it depends on what's in here, but if you had hydrogen, smel hydrogen sulfide, which actually smells like rotten eggs, that's heavier than air. So let's say that you went in to fix the paddle that's down on the bottom that agitates the milk, and there had been any hydrogen sulfide. When you first get in, you may not know that that's in there, but as you go down to fix the paddle, you're gonna actually put your head into the hydrogen sulfide. Um, the other thing with hydrogen sulfide is, and it does smell like rotten eggs, if you were to go in and you smelled it, if you didn't smell it anymore, what would you naturally think? Uh, get out. But if you <laughs> smelled it and then you didn't smell it, what's the thought process? Probably not there anymore, yeah. right? If you smell something, oh, it went away. The thing with hydrogen sulfide is it actually dulls your senses so you can't smell it anymore. So if you smell it and then you don't smell it, that's actually worse. But for this one, if you had to go in it for some reason, um, what you would want to do is make sure that you eliminate all the hazards. This one has a couple of hazards. You could drown. Not sure why you would, but if you decided to go in with the milk, there's actually a potential that you could drown. So if you had to fix the paddle, then there's a possibility that that could happen. Um, the other thing is that there's an electrical thing in there. You could electrocute yeah. yourself. And then the paddles, now let's talk, you can cover that back up if you want. We'll talk about how to eliminate, I don't want to touch anything, how you can eliminate the electrical problem of the, the paddles starting up. Okay, Courtney, so let's say that for some reason you have to go in. Let's say that your agitator is broken. The best thing with all confined spaces is that the thing you want to do is eliminate all the hazards. So in this case, we have a couple of different hazards. First of all, there's engulfment. Mm -hmm. um, you could drown in the milk. So how does the milk actually come into this tank? There's actually an attachment that attaches to that bar right there and it goes right in. Okay, so right now, this tank is not attached to milk coming into it. Nope, it's not attached. Perfect. So what you would want to do is make sure that this is hooked up the way it is so it's not, there's the potential for milk to get put in there is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Perhaps someone's in the other area with the milking and, and filling it up and you're in there. The second thing is that you'd want to make sure that all the milk that's in there now is out. Yep. So is there a way that you can pull the milk out? Yeah, there's actually an attachment down there that we could put it in another holding tank. Perfect. Um, the next thing is that the, um, the agitator that's down on the bottom. That what you mm -hmm. want to do is make sure that you isolate the energy source. And yeah. what I mean by that is make sure that it's not, no one can turn it on while you're in there. So how do you actually turn this on and off? There's a knob right here and you turn it up to the 30 and it goes for our time of milking. Okay, and is it attached hardwired or is it a cord and plug? How is this actually and the power? There's actually a cord and plug down at the other end of the tank. Perfect. All right. So what you would want to make sure that you do is one, make sure that the milk is not attached so somebody can't put milk in while you're in there. Secondly, you want to make sure that the milk that's in there is gone. And the last thing is you want to make sure that you've isolated the energy source. And in this case, it's cord and plug. 
Now, the other thing that we can talk about is the atmosphere that's in there. Now, the milk is not actually something that's going to um, either um, asphyxiate you or cause you to pass out, but let's say that you're going to bring in some cleaning solution. The thing is, what you bring in may actually create the hazard. So you want to make sure that whenever you're going to do the work, that whatever you have in there, the cleaning product or the solution, is ventilated enough so that it's not going to create you to pass out. Mm -hmm. Things oftentimes people mix uh, ammonia and bleach, and that can actually cause you to pass out. And in that case, you know, although all the other hazards were engineered out, you could still have the atmospheric hazard. So mm -hmm. for this one, you'd want to make sure that that was ventilated. Um, you have a great tank with three tops, so you might be take one top off and, and blow air into it while you're cleaning it. Yeah. So the thing that with confined spaces is you really want to make sure that you eliminate the hazards. The other thing is you want to put a label on this that identifies it as a confined space. Yeah. Now, you're a small farm and it's family operated, but if you had employees that came, you would want to identify this so that nobody went into that when you're not around. Mm -hmm. Hi, so here we are back from the farm, and now there's just a few additional things that I think we should cover that we didn't really get a chance to address while we were out at the farm. The first thing is, if you are going to do confined space entry, one of the most important things to do is always do air monitoring. And you would have to have a piece of equipment that's able to detect oxygen, combustible gases or vapor, and or toxic gases and vapor. And the thing to remember is the order in which you test. It's extremely important that you always test for oxygen first. And the reason is that the machines, the instruments that you use to test the air in a confined space utilizes oxygen. It does actually, it, it simulates a little explosion to detect how much combustible gas is in there and it's critical that you always test for the oxygen first because if you don't have enough oxygen when you're using that piece of equipment it will give you an inadequate reading so if you're going to be going into a confined space and you are doing air monitoring always test for oxygen first remember that some of the contaminants that are in these atmosphere like carbon monoxide have very poor warning qualities carbon monoxide is colorless it's odorless However, it is an asphyxiant and it can kill you. So always be careful. Carbon monoxide is the off-gassing of a, some type of combustion. So if you have a salamander or any type of heating equipment for that area, you may have um, carbon monoxide produced as part of that. The next thing that I wanna talk about are those other hazards that you may encounter while you're in the spaces. If you have to enter a space with a ladder, sometimes sewers, or maybe some of your equipment do have ladders that you access. Remember, they've been underground, they get slippery, they corrode, and there's also problems getting in and out of the confined spaces. The ladders also, many times there's hydrogen sulfide down there and or methane. Hydrogen sulfide could cause you to pass out and methane can explode. The lighting is also a problem in a confined space. And there's two aspects with lighting. The first one is it's very difficult to see so that the tripping hazards may be more. The other problem is if you bring in lighting and there's any type of an explosive atmosphere in there, your light could explode. You need to make sure that you either ventilate it properly so that there's no combustible gases in there or you bring in intrinsically safe equipment. Temperature extremes. It could be very, very hot or it could be very cold. Very hot can cause you to pass out, which could again lead to a problem where you're not able to evacuate the space yourself. Falling, tripping, insecure footing. Although you may have locked out or tagged out the, the equipment in there that is moving, you may trip over things. If you're bringing in any kind of a hose, you could trip over the hose. Striking moving parts. For example, in a bulk tank agitator, if you're working down near that and you hit your head on it, you could pass out. You could knock yourself out. Entanglement of shafts, augers, pumps, anything that's moving, you could get your, uh, your, your clothing stuck on it. You may get trapped underneath it. Falling objects. Although it seems funny, you've heard the term, throw me a wrench. Um, I've actually done inspections where somebody threw somebody a wrench and unfortunately it hit them in the head weather conditions can change. The thing with weather conditions is it may start to rain. If you have any type of acid that's in the tank that you may do an acid wash, if it's an open top tank and the weather starts, if it's snowing or raining, that can actually 
you always add acid to water, never water to acid. So the thing is that if you have any type of acidic materials that you're using in the tank to clean it, then the weather condition can suddenly change things. And the last one is noise. And although noise isn't going to hinder your ability to get out of a confined space if you need to, what you may not hear is if someone yells a command to you, watch out, look out, anything that's going to limit your ability to protect yourself while in the confined space. If you're doing any kind of grinding or anything, that noise can be high enough and loud enough so that you can not hear any type of alarms or emergencies that someone tells you are happening. The next thing is what are actually some of the sources of hazardous atmosphere? You may say to me, well, there's milk in the tank. Milk is not a hazard, but you have to think about chemical reactions. What are you bringing in? You may be using ammonia as a cleaner. You may be using a chlorine solution. Always remember that you never mix chlorine and ammonia. Oxidation reduction reactions, decomposition of organic matter. If you're going into a silo, you may have um, grain, you may have products that are in there and they decompose. When they decompose, they give off different chemicals. You may have hydrogen sulfide, you may have methane, there may be nitrogen oxides in there. Also cleaning reagents, what are you actually bringing into the tank to do work with? Are you welding? Are you doing any type of cleaning? If you're welding, you may be grinding. There may be dust hazards. You could be sandblasting. If you're doing welding, you may be inerting with a non-flammable gas. If you have a non-flammable gas, it can actually replace the oxygen, which what causes the weld or, or forms the weld. It may actually de be decreasing the oxygen so you can't breathe. So not only think about what's in the confined space, but what are you bringing in and introducing to the confined space that can actually cause the hazard, even though you've taken the milk, grain, or other products out of that area. Another hazard is oxygen deficiency. And that, this is actually when your oxygen concentration is less than 19.5%. And that can actually be a result of the decomposition of organic matter. If you have your silos filled with grain, um, the displacement of oxygen by gases and vapors, we just talked about inerting with non-flammable gases. Oxidation of metals. If you have a tank that's rusting, the oxidation of the metal can actually cause a, de a decrease in the amount of oxygen that's available. Combustion. If you're doing any kind of combustion in there or if you have a heating piece of equipment in there, depending on the size of your confined space, that can cause a decrease in the amount of oxygen. Or the last thing is high heat and humidity. Anything above 110 degrees Fahrenheit and 80% humidity can actually cause a reduction in the amount of oxygen. The amount of ox as the amount of oxygen goes down, it becomes a problem and you could pass out, you can become incapacitated. Anything that's going to hinder your ability for self-rescue from a confined space is a problem that has to be eliminated or controlled. Two contaminants that can also be in your confined space are carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide. Carbon monoxide has very poor warning qualities, which we already talked about. It's toxic, but colorless and odorless. You don't know when it's there. It's a result of the combustion of gases. And the problem is, is that when carbon monoxide is emitted, just like when you start your, your heat, your um, furnace up in the winter, there's oftentimes carbon monoxide problems, which people attributed to flu. Headaches, nausea, dizziness. You may not know, but you're actually being exposed to high levels of carbon monoxide. What you have to do is make sure that you adequately ventilate the space to minimize or eliminate any carbon monoxide. Hydrogen sulfide, another contaminant that is basically the decomposition of organic and sulfur containing materials, is flammable and colorless. It does, however, have a very high odor threshold, which means you can smell it at very low levels and it smells like rotten eggs. The one thing that it does do is it dulls your olfactory senses. So if you smell it and then you don't smell it anymore, the problem is, is that it's probably at higher levels and you've just dulled your senses. Hydrogen sulfide is heavier than air. So if you are doing any kind of air monitoring, you wanna test down at the bottom of the confined space because it's gonna to settle towards the bottom. Methane, another product which could be in the confined space is colorless and odorless, but flammable. And it displaces the oxygen. 
methane is lighter than air. So whenever you open the top to a confined space, it'll be up at the top of the confined space if it has a, a lid. Always remember that when you're testing, the methane would be up towards the top of the confined space. Carbon monoxide will be about the middle and hydrogen sulfide will be down at the bottom. So you want to make sure that you're continuously testing for all the different contaminants at they may, as they may be at different levels. Methane can cause dizziness, difficulty breathing, and it can also turn your skin a bluish color. Um, the problem with methane is it's highly flammable and will explode if you introduce any type of ignition source into your confined space area. Silo gases are carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxides, and they are produced as the result of the silage fermentation process. There's a significant problem in conventional tower silos, which are confined spaces. They may also be a problem in ag bags and the concrete bunker silos. Nitrogen oxides would cause a burning sensation in your lungs. If you have a confined space where you suspect there could be silo gases, you want to adequately ventilate them prior to doing any entry and also test to monitor to make sure there's not pockets of silo gases that are in there if there's an entry that's required. So now that we've talked about the different hazards in confined spaces, remember you can have a confined space but maybe a non-permit required confined space because they don't have any of those other hazards. They don't have or contain the potential for a hazardous atmosphere. They have natural or permanent mechanical ventilation and all the other hazards have been eliminated. So you've, you've drained out the liquid. You've made it so that you can't become engulfed in the material. You've locked out or tagged out all of the electrical equipment and you've trained your employees how to do this and that they know never to get into a space that's a permit required confined space. So how do you get started on permit required confined spaces? First of all, you want to survey all of the areas that you have on your property to identify what are the confined spaces. So go through, ask yourself the three questions for each of these areas. One, are they large enough so someone can get into and actually do the work? Two, is there limited means of ingress and egress that would actually cause a rescue to become very difficult? And lastly, they're not designed for human occupancy. What are they designed for? The next thing is determine whether or not there are permit required confined spaces. And this is when you identify the hazards in each of the space and inventory it. And remember that the condition can always change and that should be kept in mind. For example, if you're cleaning with an acid and it begins to rain, that can cause a problem. Next, you want to label these spaces as permit required confined spaces do not enter. So you have a space that's a confined space and it has potential hazards, you label it. This is to make sure that your staff know that there's potential hazards in there that either exist or could exist based on what activity is going to happen. Train your employee on these confined spaces and the dangers that they have in them and make sure that they never enter them for any reason. And also recall that anytime you pass the plane of entry, that is considered entry a confined space. Opening the lid and putting your head in can be hazardous. If it's methane, it's going to be the first thing that comes out at you. Determine if that space has to be entered to perform the activity. Is there a way to do the activity from outside? Courtney talked about they have a scrubber that's already built into the system and an agitator so that they don't have to enter the system. Determine if the activity can actually be performed in another way without going into the confined space. And is there a way that you can eliminate the hazard? If you do have to perform the activity, determine if all the hazards that exist in there can be controlled or eliminated and always do that prior to any entry. If these hazards can be controlled or eliminated, train your employees on the hazards as well as what are the measures and methods to con that are going to be implemented to control all hazards in the confined space and prepare a protocol so that people are aware that never enter the space without looking at what are the potential hazards and methods to control them. If the hazards can't be controlled or eliminated, you may have to hire a professional to come in and do the correct confined space entry because they'll have the training, they'll have the equipment. Always consider hiring out if a confined space entry without the elimination of the hazards is required. 
If you don't want to hire a professional, but yet you feel you still have to do the confined space entry, you must do it properly. Remember, oftentimes confined space entries result in multiple fatalities and are most often atmospheric hazards. To do the confined space entry properly, you have to obtain and properly maintain the air monitoring equipment that you're going to use to identify those hazards, always testing for oxygen first. Purchase the right personal protective equipment and rescue devices if you're going to have to pull someone out to develop the appropriate protocols. And lastly, work with your area first responders so they know what your confined spaces are, what are the hazards that are in them, and what type of rescue would they have to perform if something should go wrong. In closing, remember, confined spaces are extremely dangerous and frequently result in multiple fatalities. Never take chances with a confined space. Thank you very much for the time to review this video and learn about confined spaces as well as the hazards they pose and methods to eliminate them or control them so that you can do the work that you need to do. Please feel free to contact the Onsite Consultation Bureau, which is in our division, if you have any questions or concerns regarding confined space or other hazards that you may encounter on your dairy farm.